Great morning, business owners and managers. Wes Walters here, and welcome to another awesome episode of CX in the Morning, Customer Experience in the Morning. I am your gracious host, Mr. Wes Walters, and on every single CX in the Morning, I bless you with customer service tips, customer experience tricks, and I leave you with gems. And by gems, I mean actionable takeaways that you can implement at the speed of now. Immediately after this broadcast, you'll be able to take what you've learned sharing it with your team and your business, making both your team and your business better. So it is hump day Wednesday. How has everyone's week been thus far? Just out of transparency, this one is recorded. It is not live. So if you comment in real time, <laughs> if you see anyone replying, it's not me. <laughs> so this one is uh, pre-recorded because I had to travel this week and uh, support clients um, on site. So I had some on site training this week. So this is not live. But anyway, I saw this uh, this interview and uh, I kind of like what I saw. So I'm going to share screen and we're going to watch it together and give you some social, some commentary on it as we go. So this is, without exaggeration, one of the most important companies in American history. Embattled restaurant chain Red Lobster has a new CEO and a steep climb ahead. There were certainly big mistakes made over the last few years. In the wake of bankruptcy this year, the chain is leaning on Demola Adamaleku. There's a lot of regulars. Formerly the CEO of P.F. Chang's and just 35 years old. You know, when I took over P.F. Chang's, I was 30. So now I feel old. <laughs> yeah, 35. I feel, I, feel like, I feel experienced. Hey, how are you doing? You bring the food out earlier. It was, it was perfect. I appreciate it. So how does this new CEO plan to save Red Lobs? Already, I like this guy, man. I mean, um, he has charisma. Uh, as the young, my, my kids will say, he has riz. He has riz. He's very friendly and very, very uh, uh, personable. He has a smile, has a smile. He And, and man, I, I like him so far. We'll get the ultimate feast. We sat down for a chat over some, well, lobster. I've never had lobster on pizza. Well, you're, you're about to try it. <laughs> After ordering, we proceeded straight to the elephant or shrimp in the room. When you saw it and the shrimp, you know, what did you think? So that's a very expensive product to, to give away endlessly. When you have endless shrimp and people are coming in and sitting down at the table and eating for hours, as much shrimp as they possibly can, yeah. you stress out the kitchen, you stress out the servers, you stress out the host, people can't get a table. It creates a lot of chaos and you saw a lot of that. Already. Um, so what he's saying is absolutely true. So let's just say and this is um, a problem I see with a lot of smaller restaurants, chains that I work with, that they're trying to pretty much duplicate what the big boys are doing. And this is where they run into problems. So I'm going to give an example of how detrimental this was to Red Lobster and how it is to the clients who are trying to duplicate it. So, so that we can get a quick understanding, I'm going to use round numbers. This is not the official numbers that Red Lobster makes per hour per table. It is not, but I'm using round numbers, 100 for one, so that we can both grab it. You don't have, you can, this is fifth grade uh, mathematics, all right? So with unlimited shrimp, let's just say each table at Red Lobster generates $100 per hour, each table. This is an average, sometimes it's 90, sometimes it's 110. But for conversation state, and for this example, we're going to say each table generates $100 per hour. So it would be fair to say after two hours, that table would generate $200. Fair? After three hours, people are continuing to eat. It's a birthday party. It's an anniversary. They're taking their time. They order, order another bottle of wine. So now that table has uh, uh, the people at the table have been there for three hours. And it's fair to say that the table has generated $300. Everybody's still with me. All right. Father is feeling really, really, really happy. Daughter aced her bar exam. Another bottle of wine. And now they want dessert. 
So they've been there for four hours. Table has generated $400. Everybody's still with me. Now, the problem with unlimited shrimp is that they show up for the first hour. They spend $100. And everyone got unlimited shrimps. So now, although four hours in, the table has still only generated $100. So you see how detrimental that is to the bottom line because this table is just hemorrhaging money. Now, the man hours that are required or the work in the, the team in the kitchen is not slowing down. They are constantly bringing out more shrimp. So they're working as if the restaurant or that table specifically is generating more revenue for the restaurant, which in fact is not. So the restaurant and the establishment are just bleeding money, this hemorrhaging. So this one table with unlimited shrimps are still, unlimited shrimp, are still is still only generating $100 for four hours compared to a table with no unlimited shrimp for four hours have generated $400. Everybody saw that. So him coming in and immediately saying, we have to stop this hemorrhaging, just saved Red Lobster thousands of dollars per hour, not per month, per hour. See how this affects the bottom line. Just by one shift, we talk about the six millimeter shifts coming in and with his expertise, expertise, saying, hey, this is a very, very costly uh, I, a menu and item to be given away unlimitedly. We're going to put a stop to that immediately. Let's move on. Hope everyone got that example. I used simple numbers, 100 for one, so that everybody could get it. Let's move on. Are you glad that Endless Shrimp is done? Was that pretty crazy? Actually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. Food quality is very good at Red Lobster. It has been since its inception. Now, and now, in addition to the kitchen, the servers are preoccupied with this one table, which is a trickle down effect because they're only going to, no matter how much, how much they work with that one table, they're still going to get one tip. Let's just say the dad is like, man, server Wes Walters is amazing. Server Wes Walters is amazing. I'm going to give him a $25 tip, which when I was serving, $25 was good. I am still, even if I was there for four hours, I still only get one $25 tip. However, if I was serving, which I'm probably going to be serving more tables, but in that four hours, if that table had flipped four times, I could have gotten $100 four times. Everybody sees that? So the kitchen is bleeding. The servers are bleeding. The bartenders are bleeding. Well, the bartender, the bar is making money, but the servers in the kitchen are hemorrhaging because of this unlimited shrimp, and the restaurant is losing inventory and money. I'm glad he came in, and on day one, he's like, "We're gonna get put it into that." The menu's gotten too big, so we're gonna uh, reduce the menu, but in a very intelligent way. Do you think you, we, you guys, might need to close more restaurants? We intend to be done closing restaurants. Mm -hmm. Intend to grow from here. Grow from here. It in terms of the business, uh -huh. right? Another interesting um, um, evaluation or obs observation as soon as he got in, he's like, hey, the menu has too many items on it. One, when our customers come in, they have what's called analysis paralysis. So, and I know the average person who is who hasn't studied restaurant think, well, you know, it's only an additional five minutes. But the compounding effect of this, if you have 100 tables and everyone is taking an additional five minutes, you do the math on one restaurant times 500 restaurants. So it's great when your customers come in and they know exactly what they want. They order it, they eat, and they're gone. So you can flip that table and do it over and over again, rinse and repeat. If you have this en encyclopedia, the Britannica, when they come in, they're like, uh, I want this. Um, what's this? Tell me a little more about this. Uh, okay, I don't want that. I want this. Is it fried? Is it uh grilled? No, it's only fried. Okay, I don't want this. I changed my mind. Um, 
I want the scampi. Uh, what kind of oil is it? Olive oil or a vegetable oil? Vegetable oil? Okay, I don't want the scampi. One of the most interesting things that Steve Jobs did when he returned to Apple was be before he got back, Apple had a slew of products. They were selling this. They were selling this. They were trying with this. Steve Jobs came back and he shrunk the menu. He said, we're going to sell three products. We're going to sell an iMac, which is a desktop computer at home. We're going to sell a, um, a power book where you can have a computer, a Mac on the go. And we're going to sell an iPod. Three products. He, 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 he cut the fat and trimmed the menu, which this gentleman is doing. He trimmed the menu from a slew of products. So Apple is going to be known for three products. A computer, a Mac for home, a Mac for when you're on the go, a power book, and an iPod. That's it. So this guy is already, already displaying that he has the brain power and the know-how to turn this business around. Let's keep going. There's going to be... Um investments in the product that will take time. Infrastructure investment takes time. Technology investment takes time. There's 545 restaurants. So fixing every broken HVAC and every broken, every torn carpet and every uh, chair that needs replacing will take time, but the impact should be felt right away. Let me talk about that. Uh, one of the first signs of a company being in, heading in the wrong direction or in trouble is delayed maintenance. If you ever go to an establishment and you see that they're clear, I mean, blatant signs of this door has a dent in it. <laughs> and this is a high traffic area where clients pass. You see a, 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 the door has a dent, not a scratch, a dent, a hole in the, in the, in the door. And no one from engineering thought it was a good idea um, or facilities thought it was a good idea to replace this door. That's the first sign of delayed maintenance. And that's the first sign that a company is in financial trouble you go to the parking lot and there are potholes the size of mars that's the first sign that this company is in financial um trouble if uh when i used to work av um the podiums if the podiums are like we could always tell from an av point of view in the ballroom if the company if the hotel was in dire need for cash because if the podiums look awful, if they're scratched up, if, because you got to remember, in an AV production, the podium is the first thing on camera. When the talking head or the person at the podium is talking, if the podium has scratches and holes, most, lo most podiums have the logo. They say Hyatt, they say the marquee, they say the W on the front of the podium. And that's by design. So that every, whenever there's breaking news, or let's just say the president is doing a, a press conference, that podium has the company's, the, the hotel's logo on the front. So people can say President Blank was at Hyatt on MLK. President Blank was at the W at 183rd Street on, on yesterday. That Logo is very vital in regards to brand awareness. So podiums have the logo on it of the hotel. If you see a podium and it has dents and scratches, signs of delayed maintenance, that hotel is in problem. We knew this as an AV team going into it. Let's keep it moving. I'm kind of, I kind of want that lo a little of that lobster tail. Oh, you don't have any? Oh, yeah, we have to. Well, we can split. I don't mind sharing. Please, take the whole thing. <laughs> I've, had to, I've had to plenty of times. I think I matured relatively quickly. I've been in positions of authority for a long time. My 35 might be different than somebody else's 35, but these are just numbers. It's about your experience, who you are as a person, the quality of your uh, character, your integrity, your intelligence, your communication ability. There's a lot of things that are different person by person. And age is just one of them. Man, I like this guy. I really do. If you notice, the things that he mentioned had nothing to do with his degrees, uh, nothing to do with his certifications, none of that. 
he mentioned boys and girls listen up if you and, and i want you guys to on the replay share this with your kids all he mentioned were soft skills let me play that again listen to what he, he mentions these are just numbers it's about your experience who you are as a person the who you are as a person your integrity how you treat others how you make others feel quality of your uh character 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 do you do you have integrity? Do you do what you say? And when you can't do it, do you let people know? How do you treat people? These are soft skills. Your integrity, your in integrity, intelligence, your communication ability. Intelligence, communication. Do you have a firm hand handshake? Do you make eye contact? Do you look someone in their eyes when you're having a conversation with them? Do you mean what you say? And say what you mean. There's a lot of things that are different person by person, and age is just one of them. They make work feel like not work, like, yeah, like, yeah. like family. We're family. We are family. You are family. You've in the past said that you don't separate work and life balance, that work kind of is, is life. That's a, you know, that's a pretty different philosophy than a lot of people have right now. Well, if you listen to what I said, I said this works for me, and I don't expect anybody else to follow, live life the way I do. Work Interest, man, I really like this guy. So one of the problems that I find with a lot of uh, my clients is that they said, hey, Mr. Walters, Mr. Walters, my team doesn't have the zeal and the enthusiasm as I do. What can I do to uh, build morale? I said, uh, stop right there. Building uh, morale and having your team to be as excited and enthusiastic about your company are two totally different things. Company morale, we can work on company morale. I can help you with that all day. Your team members are not going to be as gun ho for your company as you are. Period. Let that sink in. Remember, your establishment, your business, this is something that, this is your baby. This is your baby. Not theirs. This is your baby. So this is something that they have been, you have been thinking about for years and now you gave birth to it and it's here. So here you are thinking that the daycare provider is supposed to be in love with your baby, your newborn, as you are. No, your, your daycare provider is going to protect, care, feed, nourish, playtime, entertain your baby while you're at work but they are not going to have the love for your baby and the dedication. They'll have dedication, but it's not going to be the same. The, 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 the daycare provider is not going to be as dedicated to your child when you gave birth to the child, when you carried the child for nine months. When you were thinking about the child for nine months and you gave birth to it and now it's real, only you will have that dedication. Now, as a CEO, there's a different level as well. So he has a dedication. But I wanted to jump in and say, talk about that because there's a difference between company morale and enthusiasm of employees that I find a lot of my clients think that it did the same thing and they're not. Work to me is purpose. When you wake up every morning and you're excited to do something, it stops being work. Do I expect everybody who works for me to be like that? No. In, you know, maybe, maybe because I was a server when I was young, but I understand what it's like to work in a restaurant business. And he was a server. This is, now this, I really like this guy. And, um, and why this, um, I wanted to um, give my feedback about, or my reaction, do a reaction video to this, is because I started out as a server at Red Lobster. <laughs> Red Lobster, Candler Road, Decatur, Georgia. So uh, this story is very important to me. And uh, the fact that he started out as a server shows that he understands. It's, it's almost, it's very difficult to lead. Lead those who you have never walked in their shoes. So he started out at the bottom of the restaurant industry. So it's not that he's this CEO and he can't relate to what servers are going through or people at the bottom of the food chain food chain, and pun intended, people bottom of the food chain are not experiencing or what they're going through. No, he's like, I, I was a server. I used to bust tables. I used to clean up tables. I used to <laughs> fill salt and pepper shakers. 
So that's a good thing. So he understands the spectrum of the supply chain, well, supply chain, well, the chain in the restaurant from server to CEO. So that's very vital. And I think that's one of the reasons why he, um, he has a track record of P.F. Chang and here. And P.F. Chang, I love P.F. Chang. So the success he had at P.F. P.F. Chang, they're like, hey, what you did for P.F. Chang, we want you to do it here. Now, I want to say this. Um, let me let this go. So nothing keeps me up at night. I'm just, I'm energetic about the work. And the more quickly we can get it done and the better we are at achieving our goals, the better life will be for 30,000 people that work for us. That's the most important thing to me. Enough said, enough said, enough said. I like it. I like it. I really like this guy. Um, let's address the, um, the elephant in the room. So a lot of people would say, it, it, this is worth addressing. A lot of people would say that they normally bring in black CEOs when a company is about to fail so that the last image of that company, the last CEO, is a black CEO and black failure. So um, I, don't, I don't subscribe to that. Um, has it happened in the past? Do we have data for that? Of course we do. Um, and um, But I tend to lean in with, hey, companies fail all the time. And whether the CEO is black or white or purple, it doesn't matter. So see, uh, companies fail all the time. It's a great opportunity. And failure is part of success. It's a great opportunity for him, although he's black, for coming in and turning the company around. I don't know Red Lobster's financials. I don't have those in front of me. What I saw in this uh, three-minute video is if there's anyone that can turn the company around, is this gentleman right here. This guy is sharp. And he has the business acumen and the experience to turn it around. And although he's young, like he said, 35 is young compared to what? I was a CEO and I've been in positions of authority for quite some time. So he was a CEO already at 30, did five years there. Now he's here at, at Red Lobster. So yes, I wanted to address that because I'm, one, I am African-American and that is something, um, if you're not African-American, this is a conversation or a not part of a knowledge base that African-American CEOs or African-American business owners know. So if you're not aware of that, if you're not African-American, I just let you into a little secret. So it is known that uh, the conversations is always, they will hire a, companies will hire a black CEO when a company is about to fail. So that when it does fail, like they have insight. They're like, not only is it going to fail, we are going to close the company in six months, but let's bring in a black CEO so that when, and he's not aware of the closing. He just thinks that it's a great opportunity and we believe in you and you can turn the company around. And the people at the, the, the shareholders, everyone is like, we're pulling the plug on July 1st. He's coming in on January 1st. He thinks he's going to do, he's going to wave his magic wand and turn it around. We have agreed. We're closing the business on July 1st. We're selling stocks secretly. Nobody's going to know. He thinks he's going to turn it around. And then the company, quote unquote, fails. And it's, see, black CEOs are stupid, the incompetent. Bring this guy in, couldn't even turn the ship around. He's a failure. So the last image and what goes on Wikipedia is that X company failed. And who was at the helm of the organization? Oh, the black guy, the black lady. So I wanted to address that. I believe in this guy. I think if there's anyone who can turn the company around is him. We will see how this pans out. And um, I would like to see Red Lobster uh, to stay in the business. Because again, I started out in Red, at Red Lobster and I don't think I would have been able to make it through college with those tips, without those tips. Those tips were very instrumental in uh, me being able to finish college. So uh, hope for uh, Red Lobster and hope for the CEO. I'd like to know what you guys feel about what you saw. Drop a comment in the be below and let me know your thoughts. And until next time, see you guys next week for another. Thank you for tuning in for another awesome episode of CX in the Morning. And I will see you guys next week. Peace. <laughs>